There's a story inside every smoke shop. With every cigar and with every person. Come be a part of the cigar lifestyle of Bovida. This is Box Press. Welcome to another episode of Box Press. I am in Miami at Perdomo's headquarters. I'm sitting down with both Nicks, Nick Jr. and Nicholas III. I'm absolutely ecstatic. I've started my morning off on the right cigar, which is a champagne, by the way. The Perdomo, Connecticut, absolutely love it. And now I'm smoking the 10th anniversary. Nick, you, you're smoking the 10th anniversary. And Nicholas, you're smoking the Sun Grown. I'm smoking the 10th anniversary Sun Grown. Sun Grown. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for joining me. This is huge. Well, thank you for having us. Thank yeah, you. this is great. Now, before I started the show, I pulled both Nicks aside separately, and I called this segment, How Well Do You Know Me? And this is Father's Son. So this should be interesting. If they don't score a 75% or higher on four questions, they're gonna dissolve their relationship, continue getting out of business. One will go one way, one will take Nick's sticks, the other one's gonna take champagne, and that's gonna be the end of the story. I'll take champagne. Okay. <laughs> Nicholas has got champagne. No offense, Nick, I'm going with Nicholas if this doesn't work out because I actually like those really well. You should. Okay. <laughs> so here it is. Nick, I want you to answer what your son would have said. Okay. What is your favorite band? The Police. Ding, ding, ding. Nicholas, you got it right. You said your dad loves 70s rock and roll and you put The Police at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're one, one for four. You're doing good. Nick, what is your favorite TV show? Uh, this isn't looking oh, good. Oh, The Blacklist. Oh, he pulled, he pulled it out there at the end. Ding, 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 that's correct. Oh, he wow. said, All right, so we're two for two. Yeah. I got a little nervous for you there because I thought he yeah, was... Yeah, I really hardly watch TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's steady as a rock. He's not even flinching. All right. Food. Nick, what is your favorite food? Steak. What type of steak? Uh, I like ribeyes. <laughs> three, three out of four so far, we're doing good. I pushed the boundaries a little bit. I would have given you the point for steak, but I wanted to see if he could actually <laughs> nail the cut. Nice job. Thank you. All right, here's the tough one. Nick, what is your biggest accomplishment? What is your best accomplishment throughout your entire life? This is at the pinnacle. This is where I say, this is it. This was the best thing I've ever done. My greatest title is being a father. Whether he guessed that right or wrong, that's, that's, that's my greatest title. Ding, ding. Four out of four. You got four. that right? Heck yeah. Ooh. He said, you getting married and having children. Without a doubt. So the title of father, I'll give it to you because that is spot on. That is true. Wow. All right. Impressive. Four for four for Nicholas. I, I, I still got, keep champagne. I, I still keep champagne. You can have it. You can have it. Oh, God. That's going to be tough to catch that, man. Okay. So now we need to know your answers to the exact same questions to see if your dad got them right. So, Nicholas, what is your favorite band? Tears for Fears. Or Sticks. Mm. Or Van Halen. Mm. I don't know. So which one out of those three are we going to go with here? Because that's... You can't answer three things. This is like, you know, this is who wants to be a millionaire. You're gonna get one answer. Is that your final answer? Yes. Which one? Yes. Uh, Tears for Fears. Tears for Fears. And who, what music, sing the song, what, what's the best song that they got? Tears for Fears. What are they known for? Was it Sticks? It was Sticks. It was Sticks. It was Sticks. You failed. I failed. He's right, though. I mean, well, well no, you didn't fail. Rock band. No, I failed. failed. No, no, no. Actually, Tears for Fears is New Wave, and then Rock is Sticks. Okay, but you said Tears for Fears. You said so, Tears for Fears. I mean, yeah, but it's two different we're, genres. We're, everybody, we're, everybody wants to rule the world. Yeah, uh, they have a lot of great songs, great bands. Sticks I, would be Rock in the Paradise, right? Did you pick that? 
Well, we didn't go songs. We no, just we went just, bands. Yeah. He just asked what the most popular song was. All right. What? You still know me, Dad. Is your favorite TV show? Ma- Master Chef. Master Chef. <laughs> Not quite. Sopranos. You went with Sopranos. I thought that was your favorite. Uh, that was a great TV show. Great okay. TV show. So I'm 0 for 2 now. Okay. Yeah. You still know me. The we're, first question I screwed up. We're already up. below 75%. I'm telling you, my God. So this is not looking so good for no, you. No, not at all. You will, as a consolation prize, we'll get a box of Nick sticks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right? So what? Give them partial credit food. for the first one, at least. What yeah. is your favorite food? Steak. Ding, ding, ding. Wow, I got one right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay, what is your favorite cut? Ribeye. Okay. We'll go there. Father and son, real similar. What is your biggest accomplishment in life so far? I would say getting married. Getting married. Absolutely. You, your dad said become a director of sales for Perdomo and also the cardboard display that you made all on your own. Don't get mad, Lauren. I thought it was a business question. I didn't know. <laughs> I did not set it up, so I apologize in that regard, but... I thought it was a business question. No, but one, he's right. One out of four. You can ruse them later. I yeah, guess but hold can. on a second. One out of four, and then four out of four. It's five out of eight. Yeah. So... Yeah, you, you got know, them all right. I got them all wrong. Less but you know, you're at 100. I, I don't know my son. I don't he's know at, what's going on. You know, it's almost a C. Like 25% roughly. Okay. So, all right. <laughs> that was good. I appreciate it, gentlemen. Thanks for playing my game. Getting into it, I appreciate you. That takes a lot of risk to actually think you know somebody super. I'm well. telling you, it's tougher than you think. It is. You know? Yeah, but it it's, is. but I've been listening to my dad my whole life. You know. I would have to say that there's probably see, some I listen. truth to that. That's good. You know, because he's. Is there a difference between sons looking up to their fathers, and then fathers looking down on your son? from a perspective that's very different. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Well, I, do certainly think- don't, I certainly don't look down on him. I'm, I'm, I'm super proud of him. He's, uh, you know, I thought really the question was professionally, um, right. you know, as far as being director sales, but I know he's so proud of his marriage and that's, that's super important. So I raised you right, son. Being father and son and working together can be either really rewarding or very tough. How do you separate the two? Because some families have an oath that says, I don't want to talk about business when we're Sunday dinner. What does the Perdomo family do? Do we talk about business all the time and it's fine and pleasurable? Or is there some rub between always working together? No, I mean, we talk about business all the time. We do. It's, it's kind of like our sport. You know, we always try to think how we can do business better, how we can, you know, be better, you know, be better business partners with our retailers, how we can, you know, support our consumer more often, you know, give them the best product possible. So there's always brainstorming. There's always talks. Right. You know, that's that's our thing. A lot of the stuff is shop talk with us because we we love it, too. You know, it's it's usually never a, a confrontational confrontation or anything because we enjoy what we do. And, uh, you know, I never wanted to push my son to be in the cigar business. I really wanted him to do whatever he wanted, blaze his trail. Really? Yeah, never did. I wanted How him to. How did you navigate that then? How were you navigating that with him so that he made his own decision? Well, I, I, I told him, you do whatever you want. I'm going to support you 100% regardless. Did you want to do something different? No. Mm-mm. Did you ever work another job nope. outside of working for Perdomo? One of the things I was proud of, you know, being being today our director of sales is it wasn't because he's Nick Perdomo's son. He didn't get a desk when he graduated from the University of Miami. He had to he had to work it. And whether it be empty in containers, you have to walk the walk before you talk to talk. And I certainly didn't want anybody to say this is Nick's kid. So I rode him harder than I probably rode anybody. Yeah, it was handed on a silver platter. No, I don't want That's, to do that. Yeah. No, it's terrible. My father rode me hard and i thank i thank him every day for that um you're not going to build excellence by spoiling someone and giving it to them they have to earn it and i think that's a great thing and i'm proud to say that 
He's earned it. Um, he's got a tough job. He works with a lot of salesmen. He's known since he was a, a little kid that now he's he's their supervisor. So it makes it tough. But what I love is the open mindedness of a lot of my employees who really worked not only to assist and help him, but also the amount of respect they have for him for the work that he's accomplished right. and done, you know, so that, that makes me proud too. Let's touch on that because yeah. the age thing is a big deal. I noticed it when I worked in retail. Who are you to tell me? I've been smoking for 15, 20 years and you're trying to tell me what cigar I should smoke. Did you ever get pushback and conflict with uh, anyone? No, no, and I think because they know that I was trained by my dad, they know I was trained by our vice president, Arthur Kemper, and also I have experience. I've been I've been doing this for a long time. I'm, you know, I'm almost 30 years old, but I've been going on the road and I have so much I have so many relationships with our customers, our retailers and and consumers and you know, I've I've learned as as I've gone on and I'm obviously still learning, but I have a lot of experience, so I think I I think that you know, I, I try to do my best. I try to lead, right. you know, by example. And, well, and uh, growing up in it, learning how to walk in the shop, <clears throat> Then by the time you're in your 20s, you got the 10, 20 years of experience that lets you sit at the table with the sales team and say, my ideas are valid and my direction's valid, and they respect that. But had you maybe gone and done your own thing and then come back and said, oh yeah, I wanna work for my dad. Well, where's the experience? Where's the nurturing? Where's, you know, Nick, you haven't been teaching him the business for that long, like, how can I trust that he's given us good direction? Absolutely, he was very humble about it too, and uh, and really, really trying to really trying to learn. You know, you can imagine he was calling Arthur Kemper Mr. Arthur until about three years ago, and finally Arthur said, "Hey Nicholas, you're not you're not a twelve year old kid anymore. You need to <laughs> you can call me you know you can call you can call me Arthur. You know what I mean? So right. um, you know that's that's that that was that was the whole thing about it and. Uh, he really has blazed his own trail, and I'm proud of that. And I did the same thing with my daughter. I thought my daughter would come with the company. She graduated from the University of Alabama. She had a marketing degree, very high-end program they had there. And when she came on to work with us, Nichols knows it. She said, hey, Dad, I want to I wanna go to law school. And I said, great. And she was shocked because she was afraid to actually tell me because she thought that I really wanted her to be in the business. And I would have loved for her to be in the business, but I would even love more so that she picked what she wanted to do. So... You didn't at all hesitate and say, well, you got a marketing degree. No, why, no, no. Why the change? No, not at all. I said, you, that's what you want to do? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm, I'm all for it. What and, type uh, of law does she want to do? I think her husband's working in development, so I think she wants to do real estate law. She just graduated, but then after graduating law school, she, she had a baby, her and her husband. So the most important title for her right now is not attorney, it's being a mom. And I'm all for that even more so. So... Um, grandkids she, are great. Huh? Yeah, grandkids are unbelievable. So she, she, she attended the University of Miami because she wanted to go to school local because she's going to practice law in Florida. And then she did what she said she was going to do, and and uh, she graduated law school. And I'm I'm equally proud of both of them. Um, they they married great spouses. Um, they both are, are doing wonderful in their lives. And uh, as a parent, you know, Janine and I, we couldn't be more happy. With, with, with both our children and, and their spouses. And right. uh, I, got, I got to be honest with you, Nicholas, uh, having a granddaughter is pretty awesome. I'm, I'm waiting. Okay, just say it. Okay, no pressure. Did you feel the pressure at all? He just slightly glanced over to you and said, hey, you know, grandkids are great. When are you going to have one? We'll have one. I'm not, no pressure. I'm in no hurry either. I already have one, but, you know, I did the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> You know, there's a, you know, it's time. Are you, how about there's you? Are you going to have another? To oh, uh, my another. second is on the way. All right. In Congratulations. June. Congrats. Thank you. Thank Congrats. you. Yeah, we are super blessed. It, it took a lot to get to the one we have, Nora. Uh, so we were a little bit worried about that. So we kind of did start a little earlier than we probably should have, according to the doctor. But, and then, and then it just happens and you don't. You know, you can't choose. Boy or a girl, do you know? We don't know. We're a surprise. We're a surprise family. Okay. When it comes to the gender. Okay. My wife hates surprises, so it's very tough for me to get her to commit to some something like that. But you know, I'm a salesman as well, so I got I got that. You know, hey, let's uh, and she she you, committed. You know why you have the second one for right? You have it for Nora. That's mm. the reason you have the second child. It's. Uh, it's a blessing not only to you, but it's also going to be a blessing to your daughter. And uh, it's much easier to have a second child 
Really? Yeah, we all have a, 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 a Spanish saying. The Cubans always say when the pacifier falls, you put it in boiling water and you you make sure you wipe it down. There's no germs and you're checking to make sure she's breathing every night. When you have the second one, the pacifier falls on the ground, you wipe it on your shirt, you stick it in her mouth. You know what I mean? Because you know what's going on already. Right. So you're not so worried. You're it's not, not so hurt. jumpy. Yeah, you know that if they're pouting or crying, it's not a big deal. It's going to end sooner or later. That's the way they talk. So you learn those things. So to me, the second child is always much easier than the first child because there's, you know what's going on. How does that relate with cigars? Is the first box the hot, hardest and the and the whole line of boxes that we got behind you, do they just get a little bit easier? Um, it, that's all hard. You know what the hardest part about cigar making is? It's it, For us, it's not, it's not the cigars, it's not the blends and all the stuff that's really hard, which is the foundation. It's the packaging. Depending on other people, and we don't really depend on many people to do anything. So you don't make your own boxes? We make our own boxes. We don't make, we don't make the bands. The right. inserts, the shelf talkers, this kind yep. of stuff. So we're at the mercy of of the band makers, and our band makers are the, are the best in the business, but they're in the Netherlands. And with COVID, you know, if a guy got sick, they'd close the factory down. I mean, the supply side really slowed down there. So um, the hardest thing about cigar making, I don't know if you agree with it, but it's it's bands, is what it really? is. Really? Yeah, it's bands. I'm shocked. You to would hear think you that's say the, that. you would think that's Tol the most simplistic thing. Yeah, like you place an order. Who cares? Get 10, 10 million of them. I don't yeah. care. I'm gonna sell that many. And just go. No, it doesn't work that way. It's uh, and you make your own <laughs> staples. So for a yeah. guy who says he makes his own staples in Nicaragua, yeah. to tell me that bands is the hardest part of the cigar business. You know why? Because we don't make them. A little shot. That's the problem. You like to have that control. I, I, I do. I, I'd love to be able to print my own bands. Uh, Arthur doesn't agree with me, but uh, we're completely vertical. The only thing we don't make is the hinges and the clasp that, that open and close the box. They're made in brass. They're made in Germany. And the bands. That's okay. it. Everything. We even, make the, we even make the cellophane tubes. Everything we do. All in-house. We do everything. We have our own kilns. We, you know, we slice wood. We have... Uh, it's we have our own you know our own box company and we have a we have a big wood operation too mm -hmm. we, you know and we manufacture a lot of boxes so how many I, tons of cedar do you have to buy just to supply yeah that's a hard question I could ask Nelson that but the amount of logs that you see yeah look like they're going from Minneapolis all the way to St Paul I mean it's just it's massive it's uh it's it's big and. You have to sort and select these woods. You can't cut them during a full moon because then they sap. But you know, you have what? to. Look. Yeah, if if you cut a full a, if, moon. Yeah, if you cut a cedar tree during a full moon, the the, the tree cries. It's called, it's called it's called crying. What it does is, all the branches and root base, all the sap will go into the to the trunk of the tree. And if you cut that tree during a full moon, the wood's no good because it's embedded with sap. The tree's communicating with a full moon. It sure does. Yeah, true story. You can hear tobacco growing in the mornings. You can hear it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It sounds like Rice Krispies around 4 or 5 in the morning, especially during the second and third primings. Is he telling primings. the truth here? Yeah, tobacco, tobacco will grow up to an inch, inch and seven-eighths every two to three hours. Yeah, so you that cycle. hear the, the leaves going... You, you hear it snapping. It's, it sounds like it's snapping. And you can actually... The offshoots are actually growing. Yeah, it's a true story. People... I, I had a customer one time, and he said there's no possible way. And Kenny Kerr was one of them. And I said, let's go out to the farm at 4.30 in the morning. And we went out, and they were freaking out. You can hear it. Oh, yeah, it's true. It grows super quick. You know, you can remember it's a weed, and after we transplant it, it only has a 60-day cycle before it grows from here to about five and a half feet. So the growth is rapid, very rapid. Wow. Yeah, true story. So I'm, Of all the stuff I've heard in the cigar biz. You know, I could tell you all kinds of stuff, but it's the truth. Yeah, it's really the hearing truth. Hearing tobacco grow. Oh, yeah. It grows. That takes the cake for me right now. Yeah. I mean, That's the pinnacle for me. You know, all these things. What is the, the, the most interesting thing you've heard about the, t the tobacco industry? Mm -hmm. You can hear the tobacco grow and at whoever, 4 whoever, 30 in the morning. Yeah, and whoever tells you it's not true doesn't grow tobacco because it's true. <laughs> yeah, it's really true. What's the most important thing in growing tobacco? Well, first of all, you need to have a good water source. You need to have fertile grounds. And is that the most important thing, though? Yes, because if you don't have water, you can't grow tobacco. So that's the basics. Okay, so that's the basics. Yeah. After you got water, right. we can get water. Right. What's the second most important thing? You need to have fertile grounds that have the big three, which I call, which is nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Those are the three. That's no different than protein, 
carbohydrates and minerals for the human being, right? The tobacco plant, the root base is only the size of maybe a small basketball at mm -hmm. best. So that tobacco plant is very heavy too. So those those vein or those those roots have to spread, and if they don't spread, the tobacco plant will fall and die. So you have to have grounds or sifty so that root base keeps digging to build itself a crutch. And also, the bigger the roots, the more flavorful the tobacco is going to be. It's going to be more nutrient. So you just can't build in, in grounds that don't have good aeration. So soil preparation is very important for us before we start growing. How long does it take to prepare soil, possibly, on it average? It depends. on In Esteli, it takes longer because it's a more coarse ground. But we start with 36-inch road plows, about three feet. We go in. We're trying to bring the hard pan up. Then we go down to 24-inch, 18-inch, 12-inch, all the way till we go down to three-inch road disc. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to sift that ground and move that ground, not only to bring the hard pan up, to bring all the nutritious soil up, but we want that root base to be able to dig down there and really grab aerate it. Aerate it so it can aerate move. it because it needs oxygen. Because, yeah, we do a drip system and, and the water droplets are going in directly to the roots, and that's great. But if those roots can't move and that tobacco plant can't move, it can't grow. So right. those are really the important things. So people ask me, well, what's the most important thing to make a great cigar? I tell them it's the seed. And they look at me like I'm out of my mind. It is a seed. If you don't have a great sound seed before you put it in the ground in the greenhouse, you're going to have a tobacco plant that one is not going to grow rich in texture the way it should be, but that, that tobacco plant is not going to be hardy. It's going to be sick also. So we actually evaluate our seeds. We have a genetic team and we look at the seeds under a microscope. It should look like a marble. If it has a cut or a divot, it's no different than having a scab on your arm. As soon as you put that seed in the ground, it's going to pick up every mold, spore, and virus, and that tobacco plant will never grow it's the way it should wound. be. It's an open wound. It's an open wound. It's exactly what it is. And so, those seeds are super tiny. It's, so like that a grain of, it's like a grain of pepper. We actually grade our seeds. We have A, B, and C. B and C gets extinguish we don't even so use a it. seed company doesn't do no, that for you no we do it ourselves we have a, we have a, a tool that we we actually developed where we can actually separate the seeds you got to come to nicaragua to see it uh we actually designed it and it's worked phenomenally for the company but the seed is incredibly important then you have to have nutritious grounds but you have to have a water source there was a guy just recently in nicaragua worked for a big company built a huge farm out in the middle of nowhere in nicaragua well, he had a rock form formation underneath the plant. He never did. He never did reports to see what was underneath the grounds. He has no water source. So wait, there, wait, wait, wait. there's there's so, stone all underneath, big, massive like slabs down? of stone. This, you can imagine these are these are volcanic. These are right. volcanic grounds. These stones are, are miles. Miles. And they're miles. They're massive. So like that thing that they drag over the soil to like see what's underneath it it wouldn't pick that up would it sure it would he didn't do anything he just saw the grounds looked at saw it was beautiful and, and built this and now he has no water source because it so, can't come up through the stone yeah of course or, or it can but it's very slow no it can't go through the stone because it's, it's super solid even though a stone is porous it, it would take right. forever for right. water to come through the stone so this guy invested in all this land and stuff but he doesn't have water. That's why I said water is really the most important thing that you need. But can't you sprinkle the water on top and be fine? Not if you don't have a water source because if there's places that don't have water. It, just because Nicaragua is great and has the best grounds in the world for, for, for cigar tobacco doesn't mean that every plot of land has a water source. You know what I mean? And he's tried to dig wells. He can't get through the wells because of the stone base and all through the farms. Can't dig through it. They can't wow. even drill through it. Yeah, so, you know, you really have to do a lot of work before you design a farm. And the first thing you have to make sure is you got water. That's the first thing we do when we, when we water. would, yeah. Water. Where's the water source? Most of our water sources, we actually have rivers running around our facilities for the most part. What we look for is valleys. And the reason we want to be in a valley is for wind blockage because wind is detrimental to tobacco. And water sure. rolls downhill. And water rolls downhill and moving water is always clean water and that's really important for us. But even with that, we actually check the pH level of that water because if it's not neutral and it doesn't have a st standard conductivity of electricity, which is normal, that tobacco plant won't grow correctly. What pH are you okay. looking for? We're right at six. We want to be as neutral as possible. Six, six and a half is, is optimum for tobacco, maybe up to seven, depending if the grounds are thinner, we can go up to seven, but it has to be extremely neutral. And you can tell that. the difference if it's off. 
yeah, you, the tobacco just it grows in a weaker state because what happens is because of the pH level, the fertilizers and stuff cannot be absorbed with the water directly into oh, the root sure. based optimally. That's that's the main reason. Yeah. My goodness. So there, there's a lot of work to grow in tobacco. I hope you're People writing think this you just, down. There's a test at the end. Yeah. Yeah, great. I hope I get 75% or better. Otherwise, I'm out of a job. Well, I'm sure you could do better than what I did. I'm <laughs> sure. But, but you, you, you know, you got to look at all these things when you grow tobacco. It's really tough. People come into Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic and all these countries and have a bag of seeds and think they can grow great tobacco that way. And that's not the way it works. You know what I mean? It, wow. And I, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, I... Uh, I was, I was just on a, on a podcast recently, and, and David Garofalo was talking about it, about blending cigars, for example, just to get off the, the tangent. I don't cook. Do you cook? Yeah. Okay. If, if, if you were with Gordon Ramsay, who's won three Michelin stars, are you, gonna sh are you going to tell him how to make food? No. So no. why would some, some kid come into Nicaragua, and I got no problem because I was one of those kids, but I hear these guys. Yeah, I went to Nicaragua and I was test. I was doing some blends with this with this master blender. You know how long it took. I mean, I'm in this industry for 30 years and learned from the best, and I'm still learning every day. And I hear these guys that just get in the cigar business that are telling people that they're blending their own cigars. That would be like me going, and I don't even cook, but me going in front of Gordon Ramsay and saying I'm gonna. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a dish for you and you know But you can you can blend a cigar if you set down all the tobacco mm -hmm. you could walk me through the process, right? I could, but it would take you literally years to figure it out because it's not just light tobacco from Jalapa. There's multiple regions that have different mineral contents. Some are totally different. Yeah, but we can taste flavor. all that right now and go, yeah, this might work, that might work. Do you know how time consuming that would be? Because literally a table for blending goes from where you are all the way to the end back there because you have so many different varieties of not only seed varieties but different different types of grounds for example in jalapa we have over 12 different ground topical ground contents that are totally different right so those tobaccos taste totally different no different than where nicholas is if he's by a riverbed and i grow tobacco there and i'm five feet upstream his grounds his tobacco is going to be much lighter because he has water erosion underneath and those grounds are gonna be looser and more siftier and they're not gonna be as potent or nutrient rich than being five feet in front of it. So if I use that tobacco and use this tobacco, it's gonna to be a totally different cigar and it's gonna throw the swing or, or gonna throw the blend off or the dosage like we call it. So when you blend tobacco, a lot of it is almost like a dosage, like a, like a pharmacist who's going to put so much into a, a particular pill or medicine or, you know, when, or in a vial where, where he's adjusting. It's it's really, I wouldn't say it's an art, but it takes a long time. Why wouldn't it's you very say it's complex. an art? Huh? Why wouldn't you say it's an art? Because you, an artist can, can figure out certain things. This is something that I know people have been in the industry longer than I have that still can't come up and, and make a cigar to a, to a flavor characteristic. And they know it, they have strengths and some people don't have strengths in certain things, but to blend a cigar to really, to really come up with something, you're consistent, you're gonna make a production of 500,000 cigars from the United States and make sure every single one is perfect. It's so time consuming, you have to have so much acreage of land, you have to have so much tobacco that's cured, fermented and aged. It takes so much time to be able to do that, to start from the beginning to be able to do that. So who's blending Perdomo cigars? The guy you're looking at with six other guys, but you know, it's, it's something So you're I, relying on other people with more experience than you to get that well, I, I, I rely on people that I that I trust and, and, and me being one I'm, I trust myself too because I, I think I have a pretty good palate and I learned really from the best I learned from people like my dad I learned from people like Arises Garcia and Sarah Gonzalez and but I was a student of it and it took me a long time I wasn't a master blender in 1994 after I started the business in 1992 right I wasn't a master blender in 1998 when I well, started well you were still blending cigars you no I still. was I was working it but nothing came to fruition because you have to have a consistent product that's got to be in time and time out and you have to learn how to be objective in tasting those tobaccos and know what those tobaccos produce. So for example, I know certain farms of mine that are gonna produce more sweet aromatic tobacco, so much so that when you smell them, when they come out of the curing barn, they smell like honey wheat bread. Okay, and right. that's a great thing, and some of that's in that cigar you're 
you're smoking right there. So when I blended that particular cigar, which I did, I knew those wrappers were going to be sweet. They were from Jalapa Valley. So what I wanted to do is, instead of making just a really heavy, heavy type cigar, I wanted something that would accent that wrapper and the sweetness. So what I did is I didn't use as much tobacco from Jalapa, I mean, from Esteli. I used more tobacco from Jalapa Valley because I knew that would accent that wrapper. But if you taste the cigar and you go, this is what I like, you can offset the flavor characteristics. It'd be no different than putting too much star or too much sugar or too much salt or too much pepper you know what i mean how do you get that pepper each and every time into that cigar the way you want it it's easy when you can when you can measure something like in food but in tobacco it's different the leaves are different sizes right they're different textures you have to go to different farms so what we do i just don't say we're going to use tobacco from jalapas and codega we have them in lot numbers so we're going to use Seco from, you know, lot number 17. And those are the Secos we're going to use, which are light tobaccos. We're going to use Visas from the Condega Valley upstream over there. And we're going to use that from lot number 22 because on lot number 24, it overpowers and it masks the Jalapa. A guy learning how to do that is not going to understand that. So a, a lot of people, and I find it disingenuous, like when we do our factory tours, guys will come over and go, yeah, I went to a factory and I was blending my cigars uh, and I'm like, I was talking to this retailer, and I said, how long have you been in the retail? I've been two years. First factory you went to last year in whatever country it was, yeah. And you blended your own cigars? Boy, that's a big thing to say, because that, that, that's like me. I don't even know how to cook, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make Beef Wellington with, with, with Gordon Ramsay. You know what I mean? I can't do that, because I've never made Beef Wellington before. Right. You know what I mean? But yeah. I get, I, so yeah. there's, a, there's a definition there that you have in your head of blending a cigar. Yeah. That might be different. So would it be better if I said, I go on the same tour and I say, oh, I got to make my own cigar? You could roll your own cigar if someone taught you, but to be able to build an ingredient to make a specific flavor, because there's so many variances, and I'm talking about just me in Nicaragua. What? How about if you add, how about if you want to come up, like we make a blend for a guy that's got tobacco from the Dominican Republic, Honduras, and Nicaragua. It's not a Perdomo brand, but now you got three really offset types of tobaccos yeah. and what we have to do is we have to watch because we know that dominican tobacco has to come through it doesn't have much flavor but it has a distinct flavor and that particular customer wants that distinct flavor in the blend so i got to go to certain farms that have lower mineral contents that are tobaccos that are more loamy in ground so those tobaccos don't have as much texture to be able to offset so i can taste that dominican tobacco because that's what my customer right. wants in that particular sense a guy coming down to honduras nicaragua the dominican republic is not going to know what tobaccos those are and a lot of that comes really to be honest with you with the tips of your fingers the tips of your nose or the tip of your nose by smelling it in your eyes my dad always said something tobacco is pretty simple you have to smell it you know if it's fermented and you know if it's raw you touch it if your fingers stick the tobacco needs more time in the fermentation pile right and you have to look I don't at know. yeah and you, i'm sorry and you, have, and you look at the colors and if those color casks aren't uniform and secos which are light tobaccos have a certain color visos have a certain color and lijeros or strength tobaccos have a certain color you have to look at that you have to make sure that the guy who processed the tobacco didn't apply too much water and burn the tobacco a lot of guys, this is why I like to be vertical and grow my own tobacco, a lot of guys like to pump a lot of water in there and make them look really dark and fool the guys and go, look, this is Lijero, but the texture never lies. When you pull it, you know if it is. It's not just color. So there's a lot of varieties and a lot of variances you have to look at. But that's when all surrounded by blending. Yes. Which you're saying... Takes a lot of experience and a lot of years because... You have to know what the leaf actually does. Right. You know, in the old days, when a cigar roller was learning how to make a cigar, he had to take a whole class on tobacco growing. He had to know all the different classifications of tobacco, not just fillers, but what makes binders and why a wrapper is a wrapper. Then he had to feel the textures. So when he worked, he knew exactly what he, what he does. Today, the roller gets so much seco, so much viso for a blend, so much ligero. So many binders, so many, so many left-handed wrappers, so many right-handed, or so many left-handed binders. So everything goes goes according to plan. So you don't have any cross veins, and he makes cigars. But he doesn't know what he's working with. He everything is done for him and divided in boxes in the rolling tables. In the old days, they had to, they had to learn. And what we do is we still we we just opening up a training center because 
look, we have a lot of our rollers have been with us for over 20 years. So we have a lot of, we've never really liked to train people, but we started a training center just about 30 miles south of us in Esteli. And we're doing the same training program that we did when we started there in 1995, which is the right way to do it. Teach them what the leaf does, teach them the textures of the leaves, teach them the, the anatomy of the leaf. We actually have a, we show them. It, it's good that they learn and they visually can, can learn by seeing what this tobacco does. And then we go in and we teach them how to learn how to make cigars, whether it be bunching and rolling. And that way the guy has the full circle and close it. To me, it's almost blind. It's almost like me learning how to speak Spanish, but I don't know how to write it. I think it's important you know how to write it too. You know what I mean? And know the, uh, you know, know the nouns and the verbs and so on and the adjectives. And I think that's important for us, for our future, that our workers really know everything from the tobacco from A to Z, not just rolling the cigar, or bunching the cigar. And I think they, they, they have a lot more attention to detail if you teach them that. And I think you agree with that too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just keep, I just keep, it's just getting offhand. I just keep hearing people, yeah, I went down to the Dominican Republic and just got into cigar business three months ago and I'm blending cigars. It's, it's almost like me going, yeah, I just decided to start cooking and, you know, I just opened up but a I massive gotta, restaurant in downtown Miami and I'm making French food, you know? I got to get to the definition of blending cigars then because your, your definition and my definition of blending are different then. Okay, my, my definition, I think, is okay. Explain. What is your definition? My definition is making a recipe of almost making food and, and making a cigar that has a distinct taste that you're going to run into a production and sell worldwide to millions of people, and it has to be consistent. But you consistent. didn't start out that way with Nick Sticks, did you? I mean, you didn't no, start No, no, but you know what I did? I had Alvaro Alonso. I had, a, I had a professional do that because it was still my company, even though Were I started out of a garage. what he was making, though? Oh, absolutely, and I was learning, too, because remember, just because I owned a cigar company, and it was small, to say the least, out of my garage, I was learning, you know, God's, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. And I was listening and okay, I was so listening. Tell, to go, let's go back. What's the gentleman's name that you just mentioned? Alvaro Alonso was the first okay. guy. He passed away years ago, but I worked out of my garage. I get that. So you go to Nicaragua? No, we went to Nicaragua at the end of 1994. My father unretires says i'm yep. going to come work for you and we were one of the first guys to move into the country in nicaragua after the revolution where did you start blending the cigars then with Al alvaro yeah that was in miami we were in miami yeah we we're working out of our house and then eventually i moved to a factory on flagler street had my but you would just drive over to his house and he had all the no tobacco he, would, there? he would he would drive to my house i would buy from the brokers and they would sell me tobacco because of my father Okay, because they knew him. What brokers? Okay, these are guys. No, these are brokers that sell tobacco all around the world. They're still today. Yep. ASP Enterprises, Oliva Tobacco in Tampa, not yep. the cigar company, but right. the actual tobacco guy. People that I that are still dear friends right. of mine thirty years I later. I interviewed John Oliva. Sure, a good friend of mine. And so you're buying tobacco from him. At the time, I was. Okay, yes. so you buy the tobacco. Nicholas has known him since he was a baby. Yeah, you buy tobacco from John Oliva, and then you <clears> use. <throat> is it Alvaro? Alvaro. Alvaro. Right. To help you blend that blend tobacco. Blend the cigars, yep. And, and so then and he was also the roller. Sell it yeah. and enjoy it. Yes. And he's the roller. And he was the it's roller. It's a one man operation. It here? was a one man operation with him, my wife and I. We would we would we didn't even have money for boxes. We would ban the cigars. We would buy them from a place called the Sticker Factory in Fort Myers, Florida. And then you know, I had I had a shrink wrap machine and I couldn't afford to, to buy a box. I would shrink wrap the bundle and I would go to guys like Jim Bennington and sell him $500 worth of cigars and say, hey, you know, could you please pay me? I don't have any money for gas to drive back. Okay, but is that then blending according to your definition? Because you're not he, 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 No, Alvaro was blending. Yeah, and we were selling, listen, my, my, the last three months of the year, I sold 9,460 cigars. You know, it wasn't, wasn't much of a production, but you got to start somewhere. You know right. what I mean? But I wasn't going around telling everybody I'm a master blender and I'm blending cigars for everybody. Right, you're not yeah. a master blender. No, that, 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 but would that, you say you're blending cigars to... To sell? No, back in those days, I was, and I was really selling cigars. I owned the company, but to this day, there's people who've been in the cigar industry longer than I that still don't blend their cigars. They have they have right. people that that they pay are to do that for that are more knowledgeable. What I tried to do was, I wanted to walk the walk, to talk to talk too. So, for example, 
Have I picked tobacco? You better believe it. Have I watered tobacco? You better believe it. Have I fertilized tobacco? You better believe it. Have I been up in curing houses 30 feet and up in the air with this old guy where I could kill myself? I have. Have I fermented tobacco? Have I made fermentation piles? You better believe it. Have I rolled cigars? Have I bunched That's cigars? That's your personality. You want to know it all. I want to know it all because I want to be able to walk the walk before I can talk to talk. And it was important for me at a young age, because you gotta remember, I started younger than, than Nicholas when he started with the company. And I wanted to learn every single aspect, whether it be working a lathe and cutting wood to planting tobacco, okay? Where in the old days, we would use a spade. Yeah. And we go down, we take a coupling and we we transplant plants and I would do it one by one. I wanted to learn it. No different to driving tractors, right. doing so ground prep. learning. You're technically not blending tobacco. You're having somebody who's more knowledgeable doing that. And so you classified yourself more as like a salesman. Not I'm to, selling to, I'm selling Nick's in, in, in the beginning, yeah, absolutely. That's what I had to do. And then you learn and learn yeah. and learn from yeah. these experts yeah. to the point where you feel confident in saying, I understand the basics enough to try to blend my own cigar. Yeah, 20 years. Versus me, I don't know any of all that stuff that you just talked about. Right. And neither do probably half these or 90% of the people out there, right. we're cigar smokers. Right. So when somebody sits us down to a table and says, I got visos over here, I got a little hair over here, I got some Seiko over here, what you kind of want to do is you want to grab more viso here and this and that and this, they kind of show you and then you kind of do it and you smoke it and you go, eh, it's not, it's not but so in re- bad. But, but in reality, it's a dog and pony show because they're actually making the cigar the way they want to make it because if you say they set the right recipe out yeah hold right? on yeah that they set it up for you where you can't fail so right. for, in other words if i go i want three leaves of seco because i want to make it a little lighter well guess what happens the cigar is going to be acrid it has too much seco you can't have that many seco leaves in a bunch or if you go, I want to make it really strong. I'm going to put a bunch of Lee Head on it. The cigar won't burn. Right. Okay, because it's too it's thick. Time. And yeah. then the other stuff burns quicker and you're like, Absolutely, the then starts telling stuff. So you have to learn that. That's part of, of learning how to right. blend. And what happened about, you know, about 21 years ago, I said, I'm, I have really learned. Right. I have sat down and sat down and sat down and sat down. But mind you, you know, I'm talking... 13 years you know i've been to you know I've, I've been studying this and studying this and i started coming in on saturdays and and trying to do my own thing and you know you eventually learn stuff if you put your head to it right my dad always said our, our head wasn't just to grab our hair you got to start thinking about it but you also have to be interested in doing it too mm-hmm. so like for example nicholas is going to nicaragua in a couple of weeks well he's going to be on the farms he's going to be doing this and you know what you better believe it he's going to be learning at the same time, even though he's extremely much more advanced than I was at his age, because he started much younger than I did, sure. he is still learning. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. I'm learning every day still to this day. Right. And when I yeah. hear guys that are masters, I mean, I, you know, I was talking to you earlier about Aristides Garcia. This is a guy who's 92 years old, who's been in the industry for 79 years. He tells you every day I'm learning every day. You know, my dad always said, if you're not learning, you should take a gun and shoot yourself in the head. You got to be learning. Everything. But aren't those master blenders still learning? Because they're actually learning Absolutely. the new tobacco that's being grown and the changes. They just have these basic fundamentals that allow them to guide quicker. Yeah, I think. Versus I, a guy like me, it's like, ah, I have no idea. Just, will this work? And you go, eh, I would probably remove some viso, put into this. Oh, thanks, Nick. Okay, great. Oh, that's that smokes really well. Yeah, and how about ring gauges where right. you got you got to decide, hey man, I'm gonna make this you think I wanna make big ring gauges? I make more money on smaller ring gauges, but I have to work with the customer once, right? So when we come up with brands, sometimes we say, Okay, this brand is gonna be fifty four because optimally the, the flavor that we want we have to have a 54 ring gauge to be able to carry all those leaves in the filler to be able to be uniform and work harmoniously to make that cigar taste wonderful so sometimes we have to do that when we came out with a brand lot 23 for example this particular brand we we really zeroed in on a blend it was a it was a project between me and my father but we knew the 50 was the right the right size on that cigar you know what i mean like cool. when you came out with the six and a half by 48 on 20th anniversary, you know, we had to really work on that because you had a smaller ring gauge there and we didn't want to just overpower it right. being more concentrated. You know what I mean? So it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of intricacies. It just, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to belay it too much, but I just, sometimes I hear these guys, you know, I, yeah, I blend it. It makes uh, sense now. You know what After I'm saying? Cause they're, they're, it, 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 yeah, it's so much. It makes sense. I just want to caution with, 
when I say bl I blended a cigar, I sat down at a table with people who know how to do this. They gave me some ingredients and some guidelines. Just like I would say if I was with Gordon Ramsay and he was teaching me how to cook, I cooked with Gordon Ramsay. Spot I on. You're 100% you're right. With Gordon Ramsay. I did, did I know what I was doing and why we were adding paprika because he wanted this to come out and right. the lemon for the citrus? No, right. I, don't, I don't know. Right. But it turned out great because he was my guy. Right. It's like you. You love to cook, mm -hmm. but you're learning every day too. Right. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, no, that makes sense now. It's and, coming and, together. And, and I'll tell you the honest truth. I respect it so much that, that it agitates me when a guy says, you know, this thing, of, if I'm going to fake it till I make it. It's very disingenuous to the retailer and to the consumer. Oh, absolutely. And I just don't like it. Because and guess who pays the price? The consumer and the retailer in reality because the consumer gets mad when he tries something and it's inconsistent, it's unfair to him. And also who takes the brunt of it? It's usually the retailer and I think it's unfair. Sure. That's why I'm so resolute in when we come up with some, like people go, why don't you come up with a new brand every year? Maybe I'm not smart enough. But it takes me two to three years to come up with a blend. Like, for example, the cigar we're smoking here, we had a brand called Champagne Noir, very successful brand. But I wanted to change the packaging of it. I didn't like the way it was looking. I thought it was long in the tooth. And then I decided, you know what? I'm going to reblend this cigar. And the reason I'm going to reblend it is because I have some incredible fillers from the Jalapa Valley. They're going to work great with these wrappers we have. And I'm going to be able to accent that wrapper. So you don't I, make Noir anymore? No, no. We, we retired. This is the new brand. that. The, the, I the remember car when Noir yeah. came out. Uh, your rep in Minnesota told me, this is like drinking a 9%, 10% beer. It's strong. You're going to want to drink water. You're going to want to have, you know, ready for this. That was, that was like our Glenlivet 12. This is our Glenlivet 18 is what this is. But I wanted to come up with something totally different. So check this out. It took me literally till we zeroed in on the blend and it was my baby and look to get consensus with eight people that i have on our tasting panel it's almost impossible but i zeroed on this and i worked so hard on this particular cigar that i knew this was right and when we pass these cigars out and everybody said this is awesome that was a great feeling for me because one the respect i have for these guys right. that smoke cigars and everybody, including my son and Arthur and everybody, we would pass them around. Everybody loved this particular cigar, and people love it to this day. But I, I see these brands coming out every every three months, and I'm thinking to myself, well, again, I think it's unfair to the retailer. He's got right. plenty. I mean, how many more lines can he put in the cigars? He's only got so much shelf space. Well, to wait a minute. On shelf space, you're the king of shelf space. What you do is you bring, you you ask for space, but you ask for it to be organized. When I look at your brand, I see organization, and then I also see like it's pleasurable to look at that facing and see order. We were actually looking at some photos of disorganized shelf space, and it was very unappealing for me as a consumer to grab that. Sure. And it was your brand. But as soon as you applied the kind of matrix that you have, I was like, oh my God, it was like a breath of fresh air. Like I can see clearly now. And that's what we want our retailers to have. I mean, how many out stores do you outfit daily where we're doing planograms? And what we're doing is- Planograms, yeah. that's what you guys call yeah. it. Planograms, yeah. which is just planning the space that that box is gonna sh sit on. Yeah, because we want the retailer to be successful because if he's successful, we are. And our consumer gets a lot of bang for their buck because of the ease of shopping. I mean, how, was, how many stores do you do a day that, you know? Minimum five stores a you day. You do five stores a day. Minimum. But on that's, planogramming. Correct. That's, you know, I, we, I have 16 salesmen that, that I work with daily. So, I mean, on average, I would say five. There's certain days where I've, I've done eight, nine, ten stores. What was also interesting is, like, <clears throat> you have a great customer that has 66 Perdomo facings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're not planogrammed properly, and you say, stop. Yeah. Let me cut it down to 48, and I'll tell you why. Right. And then you do it, and they sell more. 67% more get sold because it brings organization to the human eye that can't stand chaos and disruption. How much is each person walking into my shop worth? They're worth $54.97. Okay, great. 
What can we do to possibly increase that? What can we do to let the customer buy more cigars mm -hmm. and feel confident? Sure. That's where Bovida sits as well. Where can we sell more cigars with retailers so that the consumer can feel confident in storing those cigars that you need to sell them? Right. Because if we don't solve that problem of you guys feeling comfortable with, I invested in seven Perdomo sticks, I put them in my humidor and it's rock solid. When I go to pick up that seventh Perdomo cigar and smoke it in 30 days, I know it's gonna taste just like the first one I smoked the day I took it off the shelf. Well, I think our companies have kind of very similar mindsets. Very. It's not about just selling a box of no. cigars to a retailer. It's about continue selling and having a strategy where we keep moving products. And I think that's how we built our company so exponentially in the last 30 years because we didn't follow the cigar industry. We followed companies that I really look up to like Coca-Cola, uh, Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark. Um, these are the companies that I really look looked up towards. Harley Davidson was another company that I really like. Your business is very similar to a convenience store. It is, it's all about the square inch because the retailer pays for that. And when I he know. Yeah, when he carries a Perdomo brand, it should pay for every square inch, but the only way that square inch pays correctly is if it's merchandised correctly. If it's picked up and bought. Yes. And if it sits on my shelf for more than 60 to 90 days, we have a problem. Oh, believe me, if it sits more than six to nine days, we should have a problem. And you were saying your average? Our average turnover is about eight days. Eight days. Eight days. But that's because, that's, that's if the stores are merchandised correctly. With the planogram. But, yes, which I would say probably Seven and a half out of every 10 stores that are Perdomo authorized dealers carry it correctly. Seven out of 10. Seven out of 10. We're hitting that 70%. We're doing yeah, but, good. Yeah, we're not at 100 yet. No, Sorry. No, no. We're not there. We're definitely not at 25%. Definitely not. But, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to work hard to continue building it. And we see our consumers um, and our retailers, they see how it works because we didn't, we didn't invent the wheel. It, no. was, it was done by, by the greatest companies in the world. What, what I see which is key there is you're not asking me for more shelf space what you're asking me to do is organize the boxes into a method that increases sales and you're always going to give me more shelf space because when you see it working and you're making money and i'm paying your indirect and direct cost and your rent and and your and your son jimmy's you know guitar lessons you're more more viable to give me more shelf space right but it you're has more to viable work. to use the plan Absolutely. Use the plan Absolutely. to your benefit and also to the consumers. Like, like one of the things that, that I wanted to talk to you about was that we were talking earlier, you and I, was the, the, the bag display that you came up with mm -hmm. and what, what that did for the company, impulse buying. Another way for the retailer to, 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 to make an extra sale and another way for the consumer to get more bang for his buck. And this was something that Nichols came up you, with that I was dead against it, but it actually worked up, phenomenal. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. What did you come up with? Well, I, I came up, I went to, I went on a sales trip. It's so important to go out on the road with your salesman because um, you always learn something, not only just from the salesman, but you learn from your customers too. And I was fortunate enough to be in Central Florida and uh, one of our really great retail customers uh, has a big, great cigar store called Cigar Life in Lakeland. He used to work for Publix. He was a big executive, and we were talking. We were talking about merchandising, and I always like to pick his brain because he's he's got a tremendous uh, understanding of it yeah. as well. So, you know, he explained to me about you know end caps, and I'll never forget. You know, we talked, and uh, you know, he was telling me, you know, you should do something where you create an end cap and you feature a certain cigar, put a box of cigars, say this month we're running. You know, we're talking about Perdomo Champagne or the you know the following month 20th anniversary. But I said, I remember saying in my head, I said, you know what? What about bags? What about humidified bags? You know, you just grab, catch them, you know, you just grab them. And uh, so I worked for about six months. Uh, a friend of my dad's, uh, you know, he worked for a company called Sunoco. And so they do corrugate different types of cardboard. Yep. So make a long story short, worked about six months creating, you know, the dimensions, making sure it fit properly, and, you know, trying to take into consideration a lot of retail stores are, are smaller. So, you know, it has to be a, a, a good presence, the footprint, but also has to be at a perfect size too. So um, that, that, I think we came out with that probably about four, four years ago, three and a half, four years ago. So that was something, um, you know, I thank, thank my dad for giving me the chance to 
come out with something you know to to really give a presence to our bags and i think we've our sales have significantly increased what about it about that project did you say no to why were you saying i don't like this i thought it would impede in the box sales where somebody would say well i can just get some bags and i'll buy four or eight cigars instead of buying a box of cigars but i was totally wrong and i'm glad i was to be quite honest with you what it, what we noticed is is the salesmen that sell the most bags have one thing in common they sell the most boxes of cigars so you were right and i think we started with 30 of these displays and we've literally bought thousands of them and they're sold all over the world today and um kudos to you man it worked i was at the store about five months ago and this gentleman bought two boxes of perdomo reserve champagne and when he went over he grabbed two bags so i of had the to, same cigar of the same cigar why that's what i asked so i said excuse me i appreciate the business i saw you buy two boxes of cigars you know, i'm asking why you're buying two bags of champagne too he goes, I don't want to break up the boxes. This is great. I can throw these boxes or I can throw these bags on the passenger side. I'm going to go golfing. I'm going with a couple guys. I got eight cigars. I don't have to break those boxes. The boxes I'll break open and put in my humidor. So now this guy not only buys 50 cigars, now he buys eight more. What a great impulse buy. You amortize that by customers. It's, it's just massive. It's not only massive for, for Perdomo, it's massive for the retailer. And what it's done for us it's also allowed a lot of people to taste a lot of our different brands because we have a bag for Sun Grown, Maduro in Connecticut outside of, of, uh, of Champagne. And I was just recently, I was in, I'm trying to remember where I was at. I was somewhere because I'm always traveling. And a guy said, you know, I smoke Perdomo Habano Sun Grown and I want a box of He goes, you want me to tell you how I, how I learned about that brand? I said, yeah, at least tell me. He said, I bought your Sun Grown bag and I love that cigar. So that bag helped propel a sale of a sure. box of cigars. So it's a nice ping pong effect. It goes back and forth. So <clears throat> it's a win, excuse me, it's a win-win situation for us, those bags. And, and uh, great job on that. Thanks. Yeah. Unbelievable. So as a president and CEO of a company, sometimes you got to listen and trust, trust, you right. tr trust your guys, you know, when they come up with stuff. And these guys go to college. I only went to Hialeah high, high School, you know, and but they, they – uh, they, you know, they study these algorithms, study all this stuff, study all these statistical information they read and stuff, and they come up and bring up some great things that, that we can learn from also, you know what Why I mean? Why else employ them? Yeah. Because it, otherwise you're just being the master blender and setting out the recipe and telling them to go you're, in you're, this way. You're spot on. That, that's, go down this road. Yeah, it's a great analogy. What my, if I want to go to the right? Yeah, absolutely. My, my whole thing is is to try to employ the best people that are actually smarter than you are. I, uh, one, of, one of the greatest things I love is when I go to the trade show and I'll go, can I help you? And they'll go, no, I'm, I'm waiting for you know Arthur or I'm waiting for whoever the salesman is. I don't get bent out for that. I think that's a compliment because that means that my guys are doing a great job where a lot of owners might get all ruffled. There's no ego here. My, my whole thing is DISC, D-I-S-C, does it sell cigars? And if the customer is is comfortable with with the salesman more so than with the owner god bless them because that means that my employees are doing their job and doing a great job and i commend them for it i certainly am not jealous of it i'm happy that they're doing what they're doing and they're building relationships with their retailers and doing wow. what they're supposed to do to me that's that means we're doing good does it sell cigars it does. starts there sure and you've kind of shown me that as you walked me around your whole facility here Everything you guys are doing is, does this help sell cigars? And you know, I, I, think, I think we built a great foundation because if you look at our company, one of the greatest things about our company, we're completely debt free. We don't even owe the bank a dollar, zero. Everything's paid for, we've never taken a loan, we've never taken a line of credit. After 30 years we've done that because- Never? Never. You've never, never. had to ask for cash to keep no, going. No, I ate, I ate at my dad's house for three months because I didn't have food to eat. But I made sure all my employees ate. True story. Yeah, so what? I've never, yeah, true story. I, three I was, months? Three months I had to eat at my father's because I didn't have food to eat. But I made sure that all my employees got paid. Look, everybody struggles in business. If people tell you they don't, they're liars. But I've never used bank financing, nothing. Everything you see here is paid for. I remember telling Arthur Kemper, what do you think? <clears throat> Over a million square feet of building space, thousand employees. I go, what's the most beautiful thing? He says, we have a phenomenal foundation. We have vertical integration. We make top quality products. And I said, another thing too is everything that we're standing on, we own. 
100%. And you have to be a good steward of your money to do good in business too, and you have to know how to right. do it. And look, I've made a ton of mistakes. When I built my box company, I would buy a machine and I would pay for it. And I'd buy a, well, it took me seven months to do that. I probably should have borrowed money from the bank at the time, pay 6% interest. Get there faster I would have got there much money. faster, but I think of my mother all the time, you know, and my mother don't says, overextend. don't extend, don't borrow money, pay everything. You know, my, my family's old school. So I was brought up into that old school mentality. It was probably in some cases wrong, but you know, when I look back at it, to be honest with you, after 30 years, I'm glad I did, I did what I did. Was there a point where you, ever, where you almost said, I'm kind of done with Perdomo cigars. I don't want to do this anymore. I never did because you can't jump in the water unless you jump in. And once so you the jump risk in, is key. The risk is everything and you, it's, you know, it becomes a game about winning. Today, the only thing I care about, and I tell this to my son all the time, is that you, the retailer, are confident in selling our cigars, and our consumers always say, I never had a bad Perdomo cigar. To me, that's the only thing I care about. Look, in my stage of my career, I can walk off in the sunset right now and live the rest of my life, but I work today for my son, for my daughter, for their spouses, for our workforce here in Nicaragua, and for my granddaughter. <clears throat> that's right. what I work for, you know? and. I work every day for it. The money I make today, I will never ever use it or spend it, but I do it for them. And that was through a lot of hard work and making very good decisions by having great, a great workforce. Um, I say this all the time, but it's the truth, and I even had an ad on it, even when Smoke Magazine was out, the greatest reset, uh, resource and greatest asset of Perdomo Cigars is certainly not Nick Perdomo. It's our workforce. And I've always believed that, you know, we've won 19 straight trophies for in 19 years with Cigar Journal. And every time I raise that trophy, I always offer that trophy to my workers and to my family. And the last guy that needs the credit or has to take the credit is I, because I'm certainly not the smartest guy in the company. But I'm a good listener and I try to lead the ship in the right direction. And I always think, what would my dad do? Because my dad always led that that boat in the right direction. So, I bet you I, you ask yourself that a lot. Sure, I absolutely do. My, uh, I forgot who I was talking. I said that a couple nights ago. I forgot. I think it was with my my wife. I think we were talking. We had a conversation. I said, "Well, you know, I think what would my dad do? What would my mom do? You know, what would my grandfather do? Sure, sure. Especially learning, you know, from your from from your family, from your dad, your mom, your grandparents." If your dad wasn't here today, no, no ill will there, obviously. But if for some odd reason he wasn't here today, do you feel confident that you could carry on the business? Yes, because my dad has built an incredible company with incredible people. And as I go along the way, I would continue to learn. But also, he, but almost, you know, yours, you know, my dad's the captain of the ship, and he's and he's built something incredible that. It's, it's bigger than any of us, um, but, you know, there's certain systems that are in place that, you know, I think that, yeah, I would have no, no issue. I mean, it would be a, there would be a learning curve, but, you know, yeah, I, would, I mean, it's, it's thanks to him, you know, yeah. thanks to him building. But he, then in you, you have to turn back in. Mm -hmm. He's not here anymore. You have to turn back into sure. yourself and say, this isn't going to be easy. Do right. I have the passion to keep going? That's what, that's, that is what would make it happen. You, you know, do the passion, have passion, of course, of course, of and you course. want to keep it going. I think the will, you know, I have the will to keep it going. No matter sure. how hard it is, you gotta, you gotta eat out of your mom's fridge <laughs> for three months. I don't think it'd be that bad. But no, no, no not that bad. No, no. He's, I mean, got, he's got it pretty good now. Yeah. What are you gonna tell him to remember to do? Well, when I, you're not here. Anymore? Well, I want him to follow his passion. I want him to to see the sacrifices that his father did, and uh, look. If he decides one day that he wants to sell the business, God bless him if he wants to do it. I've, I, I made my decision at, at my age, especially. I wasn't old enough. It was 10 years later, 15 years later, maybe I would. But uh, I want him to follow his passion because that's what he wants to do. Um, I, you know, you have to, you have to have, a, I have a lot of faith too in God. Mm -hmm. uh, if I didn't, I'd probably shoot myself with all the things I've had to have had to go through in my life. Running right. any business is very difficult. And the way I did it methodically 
with never borrowing money, never right. using money, struggling and struggling and just building little by little by little. You know, someone just recently asked me, when did I think I made it? <clears throat> and I told him last year. And he looked at me very perplexed and I said, yeah, it was a Saturday and I was with Arthur and uh, we had chairs and I said, I want to I wanna walk around with these chairs and I want to look at the facility. I never really see it. And I had this second floor office above the rolling room and I remember looking and I went, Arthur, man, this is big as shit. I can't believe how many rollers we got here. This is huge because I'm always looking at what's going on with the draw testing, what's going on with quality control, what's going on with here. I'm looking at all the good, bad, and ugly in, in every single person. Microscopic. Microscopically, almost like you're looking in a cubicle, almost in a vacuum, right? And you that, went 30,000 feet that day. Yeah, and then I, then I go and I'm looking at sorting and selecting and all you hear is whoosh, whoosh, the leaves. And I'm looking and I go, oh my God, this is massive. There's, how many people here? There's 972 women that are sorting and selecting fillers and binders and wrappers. And I remember when I bought my first bale of tobacco, I, I, I called my wife to take a picture and it was $360. And the UPS guy asked me if it was marijuana. I said, no, man, it's tobacco. It was because they were delivering to my home because that's where yeah. I made cigars. And I felt like Superman. I had my, my arms up in the air. But you got to start somewhere and you have to be humble. And I remember the first guy I saw smoke my cigars. He had a paper. And I saw him with the cigar, and I go to my wife, Jenny, and I go, look, he's smoking one of our cigars. We're on Miami Beach. We had two towels. We have a pot to piss in. I walked over, and I go, sir, are you enjoying that cigar? And he looked at me, and he said, yes. One word answers. One of those guys, right? And I go, I just want to let you know I manufacture that cigar. He says, that's nice. And he put the paper back up. So you ever see the movie Tommy Boy? Yeah. So remember when he made the first sale, he went, he turns around, and he goes like this. I turn around, I go like that, and my wife goes, how was he? I said, the guy was a complete jerk off. But... I was just so happy right. that he was smoking my cigars. So people ask me today, why do you guys go out on the road so much? Nobody, nobody buys boxes of cigars and says to me, I'm having a horrible day. I'm buying a box of cigars from you. Right. I had a debt. Everybody's happy to see you. Right. So to me, I feel so humbled that I can go out and talk to people that enjoy our product that have a passion for, you know, from a guy who's saying, look, here's a box of Perdomo, the original Perdomo Reserve Champagne. 22 years ago, I bought this box. This is a guy in Chicago. This is my son. He's getting married next Saturday. I'm buying the same box now. Now it's called 10th Anniversary Champagne. But you know how good that makes you feel right. when you do something. So I'm humbled by it because when you build something, you really are humbled by it. And one of the things that I was so stringent on Nicholas was I wanted him to see the endeavors, the sacrifice, the stress, that not only I did, but his mother did because Janine was unbelievable in, in right. helping me build the business. My mother, who still comes to work every day at 90. Yeah. My father, who literally died in Nicaragua trying to help the, the, the company. I wanted him to be there. And he was there when my father died in Nicaragua. So he's seen all the tragedy and all the roughness and all the things. So I feel very good when I ride off in the sunset that we're going to be in great hands at Perdomo. Yeah, I do. Hopefully our viewers got a little taste of what it takes to run uh, not only a cigar company, but a family-run business that really puts every effort into making sure you guys are enjoying cigars. Can't thank you guys both enough. Thank you. Um, thank you, my friend. Nicholas, I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the future with you and seeing what else comes of it because you're a smart kid, a smart guy, man. Sorry. It's all and right. Nick... I can't thank you enough thank for you. starting a brand that we all get to enjoy and pass on to our, our legacy and say, hey, smoke these cigars that are 20 years old on your wedding day. Thank you for being so prepared and being such a good interviewer, too. You know, we do a lot of these, and you know, a lot of guys are never prepared, and yep. you are extremely prepared, extremely functional, and very professional, and I want to thank you for that. Yeah, you made it fun, too. Yeah, That's the best compliment I can get. I didn't, I didn't come here to talk about cigars. We talk about cigars because we're passionate about it, but I came here to understand you guys, and I hope they got that. I think they did. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. That's another episode of Box Press. I'm your host, Rob Gagne, and as always, keep those cigars protected with Bovida and pick up a box of Perdomos. You will not be disappointed. Cheers.